Go as ahead. Well. Dick, you realize your two jokes have not been heard because we're only going live now. So. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> we're, we're live. All right, we're live. Welcome. Okay. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome to the... Uh, this is uh, the dream returned issue of the Beltway Poetry Quarterly. Delighted Hello, that you be with us. Hi. Thank you, Sudeepta, for checking in from, you? from India. <laughs> Wonderful. Well done. We're, we're live now, so let's, um, my prepared remarks have already been thrown out the window. <laughs> Hi, Indran, uh, Anja. Hi, Jorge. Jorge, estamos en vivo, directo, ahora. Yeah, so, uh, estoy en medio de la presentación. <laughs> I'm Jorge Contreras is joining us from Mexico, um, from uh, Hidalgo, Mexico, the state of Hidalgo. Uh, dear friend, he's got some work in, in our issue, and he'll be reading later today. All right, so back to the, the dream returned. And um, uh, You're muted, Indran. I keep getting muted uh, um, by no hand of mine. But anyway, it's it's unmuted now. All right, so uh, uh, maybe Sarah, you can give a more organized presentation when when I stop talking. But we're going to begin um, with the dream returned issue, and I'm I'm just going to read one poem, and then I'm going to hand the microphone over to my colleague and friend, uh, dear friend uh, Sarah Cagle Marin. Okay, the poem I will read is a new one. It's it's remembering. Uh, 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 the terrible uh, thing that happened, you know, the Holocaust, the International Holocaust Remembrance Day is coming up. And uh, so I just wrote this poem for an event uh, that will be taking place in a few days. The poem is called The Call Again. We do not wish for a template, a model, a primer of how genocide will unfold. Yet we have many examples, and from every part of the globe, of the precise moment when laws began to break down, the entrance stage left and stage right of the arbitrary, murder without a body cam or live witness. Then we must weigh relative against absolute history of one decimated people against another's, which genocide merits the term Holocaust? Can we identify with Jews even though we are Tamils burnt out of our homes? Who are the Jews of Asia, of Africa, of America? Is the term translatable back and forwards in time? Uyghurs, have they become Jews? Do they have the same weight in studies of loss and exile as relatives of the six million Jews gassed at Auschwitz? at Buchenwald and the other camps. Yes, there were millions of gypsies, Catholics, disabled, variants who did not meet the Nazi mold. They too shall be remembered when we gather in homes, plazas, museums, and memory banks to sit shiver, to sit in the Christian church pew on the Muslim prayer mat before gods and sprites of nature in silence at Quaker meeting until called by the spirit to speak what must never be forgotten, never repeated. Thank you. Uh, I'll hand you the mic over to Sarah. Go ahead. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, happy to be here on our second launch reading mm -hmm. for the dream return issue, which is kind of a, this is an exciting issue because um, these poems represent uh, you know, two sides of a coin, some that are written, well, we, we'll hear them. I don't need to introduce them in too much depth, but um, there's a, there's harmony and uh, melody here. And I wanted to read one poem that I wrote several months ago that I read this morning that had me thinking about that uh, pre and post time period that this issue reminds me of. 
um, hope and a little bit of fear woven in. This poem is called Leda, Leda, Leda painted during the pandemic and it's uh, for a painter friend of mine named Ilsa. Uh, so in love with this baby bird, helping it transition into this life that I missed six swans ruling Central Park's boathouse, lakes linked by seven contract tracers showing me white outstretched wings, gilded history, warring winter, frozen fires, all of us sitting cross-legged on planting ground, stroking soft soil where nurtured artichoke sprouts might one day defy curfews like me. An owl, natural as night, cawing protestations for blackness, bellowing black bodies be saved, richness restored, dragging my art around in cases, never reading even a paragraph or writing a single syllable. I go to protest every day, pouring my energy into the streets, taking videos, photos, getting sunburnt, saving baby birds from their nests. So, uh, I, I think I am happy to start introducing Indrin if you are the poets of this issue because um, I, I'm excited by all these poets and the poems that they've yeah. sent to us and that we've published. Um, and I'm eager to hear them. So uh, do, do you mind if I introduce please, the first? Please, please go ahead. So I have uh, Lisa, Lisa Rosinski as the first reader and correct me if you're not ready, um, but Lisa, the, uh, Lisa Rosinski was the 2016 to 17 Associates of the Boston Public Library writer in residence. She currently holds an MFA in poetry from Boston University and her poems have appeared in Prairie Schooner, the uh, Cimarron Review, excuse me while I zoom in on the text, uh, Mid-American Review, Measure, 32 Poems, Hunger Mountain, and other journals. And Lisa, are you ready to? Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Um, thank you, Sarah Indren and the Beltway Review for um, bringing these poems out to the world. Uh, I just want to say it's really an honor to feel part of such an international community of writers while we're all also stuck at home. Um, and I'm also from the DC area originally, so having these in the Beltway feels like coming home in a way. So thank you. Um, I'm going to read two poems. Uh, the first is called Malach HaMavet, uh, which is Hebrew for the angel of death. So that's going to be a nice, cheerful poem. And then the second is called Egg, Seed, Pupa, Spore. And uh, that comes from a, a line by Annie Dillard from the Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. So the first, Malach HaMavet, this one is dedicated to my grandmother, Rita Shapiro. For months last summer, I saw her at every street crossing, every time the bus jerked or the subway screamed. Flying was unbearable, like breathing through thick flannel. She showed me flicks in slow-mo of the last moments, pain, crushing, brief then darkness, then darkness, then darkness. It was peeling that off like a rind each time. It was after you died. It was a cloaked figure from folktales I was too young to believe. She stepped out like a stripper from behind your closed casket on that tacky square of astroturf while my mother cried and pushed us away. I stood with the live-in nurse who witnessed it. The rabbi kept babbling about something, then prayers. In the cesura of a psalm, she stepped out and crooked a finger and I stared. And after that, I could not stop seeing her everywhere. I don't think you understand. I mean, everywhere. And the next poem is called Egg Seed Pupa Spore. And um, it's from uh, a line from Pilgrim at Tinker Creek by Annie Dillard. Um, the line is, everything else is dead, killed by the cold or mutely alive in any of various still forms, egg, seed, pupa, spore. And this poem is dedicated to my one-year-old son, Elias. Everything tells me to curl inward, to winter, 
store up, shore up, wait for it to end. But the trees are blooming anyway. Starlings shriek from the heady depths of the magnolia, heavy with last night's rain. Your wiggling body, kneading milk, fastens me like a button to the rough cloth of this moment and the next one, until the urge to mute myself passes, drop of ink slithering away into the puddle. Not gone, but pale as flame that has reached the point of perfect burn, fuel equal to its hunger. I'm not there yet. Orange, yellow, blue, the candle of my mind flickers, erratic, unable to find steadiness, chasing the hot wax straight down the wick. We aren't built to hold still. You grasp one hand with the fingers of the other, level a gaze that makes me tremble. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you so much, Lisa. Wonderful, wonderful, and 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 very strong um, and and uh, sobering. Uh, your best poem and and both. Let's. We will now hear from um, a wonderful poet um, who lives in in Granada in Spain. She's a French poet of Lebanese extract. She is. Um, she is one of the most brilliant critics of poetry that I that I've ever met, commentators and analysts. Uh, she's a she's a, a musicologist, a translator, a poet and critic. She's a member of the editorial board of Place de la Sorbonne, an international poetry magazine published by the Sorbonne University Press in Paris. She's a professor agregé of music and a doctoral student in musicology. And uh, she teaches at, at the Sorbonne. Um, she will read in, in French and then uh, I'll read a translations of hers into English. Katya, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Indran, for this uh, introduction. So um, I'm going to read uh, yeah, three short poems. Uh, in French, and uh, Indran will read the, the English uh, translation. And uh, I wanted to, to thank uh, Indran very much for uh, his uh, translation work. It's, uh, it's uh, a very interesting work, working with him and, uh, and, uh, and uh, learning from, uh, from his work, work as a translation, tr translator. Thank you very much, Indran. Rien, rien à dire, rien à manger, rien à foutre, rien. Indran, you will read the translation. Uh, I, I, uh, my apologies, I don't have them right in front of me, so why, why don't you uh, go ahead okay. and, and read the three and then I will read the, the English. Okay, okay. That okay? Sorry. Of course. Veuillez m'excuser pour ce retard. Je cours dans les couroirs, perdre la vie plutôt que son train. Mes bas ont filé, les escaliers m'ont cassé de la gueule au talon. Je cours dans les couroirs, le train me talonne, le train m'a prise par les cheveux. Je cours dans les couroirs. Une plainte dépasse mon portefeuille, ne pas toucher. Ne pas toucher pour échapper. Mon pied se transforme en main courante. Le corps se vide comme un camembert oublié. Je coule dans les couloirs. Uh, Katya, I, I can now read the translation. Um, Great. Okay. The poem Katya just read, Voyez uh, m'excuser pour ce retard. In English, it's uh, title is Please excuse me for being late. I run in the running lane to lose my life rather than the train. My tights are torn, the stairs have broken me from mug to heel. I run in the running lane. The train stalks me, has seized me by the hair. I run in the running lane. A complaint sticks out of my purse. Don't touch, don't touch. 
to escape, my foot transformed, the running hand, the body empties like a forgotten camembert. I spill into the swimming lane. Go ahead. Ventre. Mon ventre, nombril du vide, voûte céleste qui s'écroule en un tremblement de chair. Uh, womb. My womb, the belly button of emptiness, celestial vault crumbling in an earthquake of flesh. It's such a short poem, I would like to just read it one more time. Womb, my womb, the belly button of emptiness, celestial vault crumbling in an earthquake of flesh. And I will just now read the first poem that Kachi read, Ria, nothing. The version in English is nothing, nothing, nothing to say, nothing to eat, nothing to fuck, nothing. Katya Sophia Hakim, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Katya. Thank you very much, Indra. Thank you. Um, uh, the next poet, you know, Navin Kishore had to uh, cancel because of a, an accident, but she, he'll be okay and he'll read for us next week. So we are going to now go to Kimiko Han. Um, and uh, I, 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 we're alternating introductions, but I, I do want to introduce you, Kimiko, because I've known you for so long and I, I've admired your work for longer and, and and the relationship goes back to New York in the 80s and uh, the word of mouth series when uh, Kimiko very kindly passed the baton to me to continue that series, which was, uh, which he founded it. It was a really a very, very important series. The first one that focused on Asian American writing, uh, heard aloud and, and then multicultural writing and all these terms were, were relatively new at the time. And uh, she uh, uh, brought uh, writers, uh, gave them a stage, and um, and some of them are, are are in our bookshelves and are in our hearts and minds all over America. Um, Kimiko Han. Uh, that's just one aspect of what Kimiko has done for American poetry. Uh, her own writing. She has published many books, many excellent books. Her latest book of poems is called Foreign Bodies, uh, which was published in 2020. So it's still waiting for its book party, which will happen <laughs> <laughs> once the pandemic ends. Um, Kimiko teaches in the MFA program in creative writing and literary translation. So very thrilled for that aspect of her work as well and her auspicious at Queens College in CUNY. Uh, Go ahead, Kimiko, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Endrin and Sarah and Don, uh, and to all the uh, many readers uh, today and also next week. Uh, here's to healing. Um, I'm going to read two villanelles. One is uh, in Beltway. Um, both villanelles are constructed from a newspaper article lines and information. <clears throat> um, this first one, the one that's in Beltway is, uh, the title is, a villanelle after Trump, quote, unleashes an unrelenting series of false, misleading and exaggerated statements as he sought to distort, end quote, or found lies from New York Times article on fact-checking the debates, October 23, 2020. Feels like a lifetime ago, but not a lifetime ago <laughs> enough. <laughs> okay, so uh, these are all um, direct quotes from our former president. Catch and release is a disaster. A murderer would come in, a rapist would come in. They say I'm immune. Nobody's been able to say that, but I'm immune. 
I'm listening to all of them, including Anthony. Anthony did not say to wear a mask. Catch and release is a disaster. There has been nobody tougher on Russia. I prepaid millions and millions of dollars in taxes. They say I'm immune. Nobody's been able to say that, but I'm immune. We have the best testing in the world by far. That is why we have so many cases. Catch and release is a disaster. Look at China, how filthy it is. Look at Russia, look at India. It is filthy. The air is filthy. They say I'm immune. Nobody's been able to say that, but I'm immune. I called my accountants under audit. I'm going to release my taxes as soon as we can. I want to do it. Catch and release is a disaster, whether it's four months or a lifetime. Nobody's been able to say that. Um, the second villanelle, um, it's not, uh, well, the title is slightly edited lines from the article, The Case of Jane Doe Ponytail by Barry and Singer, the New York Times. And this came out uh, in, I believe, the magazine um, about three years ago. <clears throat> As she grew older, she caught and collected the enchanting butterflies zigzagging by the river, meticulously preserving their fragile iridescence. I want to go to work, the girl would say to her parents. I want to pick ginseng. Then she left for 40th Road, a gritty street of commerce in Flushing, where strivers, dawdlers, and passers-by are oblivious to what is transpiring. I want to go to work, the girl had said to her parents, I want to pick Jinsen. More than once in a massage parlor, a man beat her about the face. An officer, gun held to her head, forced her to perform oral sex. Once she had caught and collected the enchanting butterflies and friends had marveled at her collection book, asking to keep one. She was fond of Heineken, Red Bull, and Colombian rotisserie chicken. I want to go to work. The girl had said to her parents, I want to pick ginseng. In the end, Cece, given name Song Yang, fleeing a cop working vice, leaped from her balcony, hit the pavement, died in the ambulance. As a little girl, she caught and collected the enchanting butterflies. Her competitors considered her territorial and tireless. A shop owner said, I hear she was number one, young, pretty, and great service. She once caught and collected enchanting butterflies zigzagging by the river. I want to pick ginseng, little Son Young had said. She was a born worker. Thank you, everyone, many of whom, many of you whom I know from way back. Uh, besides Indran, Anya, hi, Dick, hi, many of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you, albeit through Zoom, and wonderful to meet new faces. So thank you, everyone. Sarah, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Yeah, I was surveying the end of those poems. Thank you, Kamiko. That was beautiful. Um, the catch and release was ringing in my head. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it does not seem that long ago. Uh, OK, the next poet that I want to invite is uh, Mar Marilia Paceros. She is a lawyer with a master's in the economic analysis of the law. She enjoys that great interplay with the economy and the laws, which I relate to. Uh, she is a she's a reader and admirer admirer of the great Latin American writers like uh, Vallejo Borges, Cortazar, uh, Piglia, Verjas, uh, Yosa, uh, Juan Ruflo, and she is a devotee of the Latin American boom. She's a Peruvian poet and lover of Peruvian history and its legacy. Marilia. Thank you so much, Indran and Sara, uh, for promoting this meeting and everyone for joining us. I wrote 
this poem in Spanish, so I read in my mother language. And I really appreciate if Indran helped me to translate these poems. Okay, I I I start my first poem uh, called Los Amantes. Las nubes pasan lejos de los amantes. Aún en invierno están por todas partes. Las manos en los bolsillos del otro. La sensación de soy tuyo. La lluvia no espanta a los amantes. Intercambian los abrigos. Se confunden entre ellos. Caminan al unísono. Empapados se besan. Se envuelven y ahuyentan el frío. Hasta el viento los arrulla. La ciudad los abraza. Son demasiado bellos, demasiado lindos para estar en este mundo. Deberíamos pegarles un tiro. Muchas gracias. The, the Marilia's poem in English is called The Lovers. <clears throat> Clouds pass high above the lovers, who even in winter are everywhere, hands in each other's pockets, the feeling that I am yours. Rain does not scare the lovers. They exchange overcoats, get mixed up in them. They walk in unison, soaked, they kiss. They wrap themselves in each other and make the cold flee. Even the wind rocks them gently. The city embraces them. They are too beautiful, too pretty to be in this world. We ought to put bullets in their heads. Okay, my second poem is uh, talking with my father uh, in Spanish, hablando con mi padre. Padre, vuelvo a ti. Soy la hija pródiga en busca de consejo. Dime, ¿cómo se lidia con la degeneración humana? Padre, vivo según tus convicciones y tus valores, pero es tan difícil seguir de pie. Dime, hoy que vuelvo a ti, ¿Moriré como mártir? ¿Debo seguir fuerte? Permaneceré parada atléticamente, con los pies, pies bien plantados, esperando el próximo golpe. Pero, padre, no conozco el consuelo lejos de casa. Talking with my father. Father, I am back, the prodigal daughter looking for advice. Tell me. How does one deal with human decadence? Father, I live according to your convictions and values, but it is so difficult to continue. Tell me, today that I am back, will I die as a martyr? Should I continue to be strong? I will remain standing athletically, my feet well dug in, waiting for the next blow. But Father, I don't know comfort far from home. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Marilia. Thank you very much. I hope you will keep sending us poems. Muchas gracias. Un abrazo hasta, hasta Lima, hasta Cusco, in Peru, where she's reading from. Um, thank you. And now, um, I think it's, is it, uh, Sarah, is your Will you be presenting? Yeah, uh, yes, go ahead. I'll invite Anya, Anya Oxenberg next. Um, Anya is an award-winning fiction and writer and poet. She's the author of a novel called Blue Earth, uh, The Stories of the Devil Girl, which is a novella, poetry books, The Stone of Language, and I Know What the Small Girl Knew. She's currently completing another novel, History Artist, centering in characters converging after the Khmer Rouge regime around a young Cambodian African-American African woman born with the US invasion of Cambodia and a book of poetry, Matadors at the Crossing. Anya's international creative writing teaching offers creatively expansive and cutting edge approaches through her creating, through her writing for social change, Redream of Just World Workshop and the Disobedient Writer Workshop series. She's also a manuscript consultant and coach. Anya? That's better. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. It's nice to see you. Um, okay, I'll, I'm going to read two poems. They're, they're not in the Beltway, and I'm sorry, but I'm just bad. So um, the first one, uh, I think, is uh, 
very evil voices come, and I don't mean uh, as a mental condition, but as a as a global condition <laughs> in terms of who, what voices come. So this one came up. Um, it's called No Title Stops It. Tell me how it came, you, the zipper, me racing through your teeth, a shattered costume on the ground, the crystal swinging above my hand. Tell me how, you, the dough, mine the hand that pounded and pounded so you would never rise again. The meal without bread, the shoulder without cloth. Tell me how it happened, you the throat, me the necklace, a perfect fit. But for the air and the gasps were words as I shook you with a question, tell me how it happened. History, you gasp, buried, amnesiac, your hand, I drank the wine, the carpet bloody, I drank it. When they came dressed in all one cloth, history you gasped again, I can't breathe your history. They heard it, she fell, I said. We drank wine, watched the rising waters from the window. She had a weapon, I said. Of course, they said, she fell. She wanted to die and the evening was getting on. They left you didn't want to muddy the carpet with their boots that knew the rising waters, the clay ground yielding bones. You were the teeth and the zipper I ran through. I would be bulldozer over your bones, but I could not settle. The teeth sang on about breath, life, history. The uniforms left, the world drew darkness to itself. I had never seen such splendid ebony lit with stars and voices. I lay down in the rising, the earth would flower, and I could not stop it. I had moments to do a new thing. Hell bent, could not think of it. Um, okay. Bravo. Uh, Bravo. Next. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, the, next, the next is, is uh, called Matadors at the Crossing. Um, it came out of a staring a lot at a picture, <laughs> at a photograph by someone named William Albert Allard uh, that was in a, a National Geographic uh, collection. Um, Matadors at the Crossing, it's a prose poem. I want to walk away from this photograph. I want no man staring at me as he goes off to kill, albeit beast, beast. Beast of a bull, king in the ring of strength, absolutely. So what is this then, the cunning of man that means bull will die? Inevitable, that bull will die in the face of the skill of men who stand gilded, floral, red and black. One stares directly at me or the camera, directly at the camera and me, because he knows I will look at him even if I am not in the stand screaming for blood. He looks at me as he fixes his embroidered belt. So beautiful, that belt. What can I say to him? I am not Spanish, although I was before Inquisition times, before the black robed judge came down hard on the mahogany table and said, go, leave, do not be Spanish. You do not care for the slaughter of bulls in a simple photo. One matador, his wedding band gleaming, adjust his little black sack of hat. Another stares in the way that men do at his nails, folded hand held up to his face, the right way for men. These two ignore me or the camera, but the man in front fixing his belt stares at me with eyes so familiar he must have walked down a corridor in Morocco 500 years before. None of it matters, I suppose, because they are at work now. So the three stand in front of a wall, softly shadowed, but still so pink, the inside of a mouth all around them hushes any fear of the beast. And to their left, cutting the right edge of the photo is a heavy door painted a red so dark, it looks matted with black fur. And in that door is a slit in the wood, confessional, or perhaps the way a last feeded meal came in from the hand of a guard, a last curse or a last blessing. Thanks. 
Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Anya. Um, the next poet, uh, Thank you so much, Anya. Um, I know that Beltway is comp competing with many other great journals <laughs> for your poems. <laughs> so we are very grateful to have them. A quick, um, quite, uh, Jorge Contreras is, will be our next poet. He's, a, he's quite a figure, Jorge. He's a, he's a poet, he's a, published widely. Uh, he's also a, an arts organizer, a, a director of an important festival um, in Hidalgo in Mexico, poetry festival. He's, um, he's a convener of poets. He's a founder of the Poetas Sin Fronteras, Poets Without Borders, an organization that grew and grew in the, during this pandemic. And it's becoming a, a wonderful meeting place of poets uh, from all over. Um, Jorge was born in Mexico in 1978. He's published nine books of poetry, two of them published outside of Mexico. One, Vedo un coniglio guardami dalla neve, translated into Italian by Emilio Coco. And then Ballena Cincuenta y Dos Fifty Two, which was published by Buenos Aires Poetry in Argentina. The other books have all been published in Mexico. He's participated in various anthologies in both national, Mexican, and international. And as I mentioned, he's the director of the Festival Internacional de Poesia, Ignacio Rodriguez Galvan. He's a member of the committee of the uh, uh, Havana Poetry Festival and uh, the hon its honorary presidents uh, from in, 19, in 2018. He has received the, the prize, the Presse Internacional de Poesia, Raúl Renan. Jorge will read in his poems written in Spanish and, and then I'll read uh, the translations I made. Go ahead, Jorge. Eh, bueno, buenos días a todos. Gracias, Indran, eh, a Don, a Sara, a todos los que están aquí. Muchas gracias. Y bueno, voy a leer mis poemas. Soy un río. Soy un río sagrado en el que han tirado basura. Venía del oriente y desembocaba en occidente. Junto a mí construyeron pirámides. Los profetas hacían abluciones. La luna se bañaba por noches. Había peces, una ribera de frondosos árboles. Sauces tocaban mi corriente. Heráclito no se equivocó. Nadie en el mismo río. Yo era un río enamorado de la transparencia. Me hubieras visto entonces. Te habría recibido desnuda en mi corriente. Um, uh, I am a river. I am a sacred river in which you have thrown rubbish. I come from the east and spill into the west next to me, building pyramids. Prophets offer ablutions. The moon bathes itself every night. There were fish, a river bank of leafy trees, weeping willows touched by current. Heraclitus did not wrong anybody in the same river. I was a river in love with transparency. You would have seen me then. I would have welcomed you naked into my waters. Gracias. Gracias. Uh, una idea en el comienzo. Fui un grano de arena en el desierto, una gota de rocío en la mañana, una piedra en el fondo del río, una plegaria en la soledad. Fui el sueño en la tumba de Lázaro, un clavo en el crucifijo, una astilla en la varada Esclepio, un instante en el tiempo. Fui el rescoldo en la caja de Pandora, una chispa del fuego de Prometeo, una hoja del árbol sefirótico. Fui el dibujo de un venado en la caverna, la letra de un alfabeto incompleto, una ciudad cubierta por los siglos, un relincho en el helicón, la mirada de Orfeo al perder a Eurídice, fui el sueño de Venus en el templo, la mirada celosa de Cupido, fui la espada del arcángel, el cincel en el cráneo de Zeus, fui una idea en el comienzo. An idea in the beginning. I was a grain of sand in the desert, a dewdrop 
in the morning, a stone at the bottom of the river, a beseeching in solitude. I was the dream in Lazarus's tomb, a city covered for centuries, a nail in the crucifix, a splinter in Asclepius's rod, an instant in time. I was an ember in Pandora's box, a Promethean spark, a leaf of the Sephirot tree. I was the drawing of a deer in the cave, the letter of an incomplete alphabet, a city hidden for centuries, a neighing in the helicon, Orpheus's gaze on losing Eurydice. I was Venus's dream in the temple, Cupid's jealous glance. I was the sword of the archangel, the chisel in Zeus's cranium. I was an idea in the beginning. Muchas gracias, querido Indran, por tu lectura en inglés. Thank you very much, Jorge, for this poem. Este <laughs> Wonderful. You know, we're we're traveling the world here, and 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 not all the readers are reading this week. This will continue next week at the same time, Saturday the thirtieth, and. Um, and thank you for, for visiting us from all parts of the world, including India and and uh, other far flung, far flung from where I sit in Rockville in Maryland. Um, the next uh, poet um, is uh, Sylvie Poisson. Sylvie is a poet from Trois Rivières in Quebec, in Canada. She has been also, in addition to being a poet and occupational therapist and a volunteer in an international collaborative organization and NGO, she has three grown children. She's passionate about literature ever since childhood. She has participated over the years in several training courses and writing workshops. She has published in several collective publications and literary reviews. She's animated led writing workshops and taken part in various poetic readings and performances. She has been a guest at the famous uh, Trois Rivières Poetry Festival since 2015. She's published two poetry collections, Les Clarté au Fête in 2013 and Les Rives Accordé in 2018. And Sylvie will read um, in French, the, in which she writes these poems and uh, Various translators have worked on her work, including me, and we'll uh, read the translations. Go ahead, Sylvie. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Indran. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a real uh, joy to be uh, welcoming your wonderful circle today. Alors, le premier poème avance encore un peu. Non, excusez-moi, je me suis trompée. La, le premier poème, à ta, à ta fenêtre. À ta fenêtre, rien de changé. Le ciel ignore la catastrophe microscopique qui se déploie. À ta fenêtre, le grand érable, ton refuge, s'étire au-delà de tes rêves. Sa sève inlassable comme une lumière. Ses bourgeons neufs se déplieront bientôt. À ta fenêtre, la vie ne doute pas de ses recommencements. Uh, and I'll read the translation, at your window. At your window, nothing has changed. The sky ignores the microscopic catastrophe spreading. At your window, the great maple your refuge stretches beyond your dreams, its unceasing sap, a light. New buds will unfurl soon. At your window, life does not doubt its rebirth. Le deuxième poème avance encore un peu. Un bouquet de recommencement fané dans ta main le printemps en miettes. Tes pas, ton souffle, égarés sur un chemin d'ombre. Écoute au loin les pommiers en fleurs, le vent chargé de la tendresse mauve des lilas. 
S'il te plaît, avance encore un peu. Crois-moi, tu verras changer la lumière. Um, advance a little further. This poem translated by Luce Weyer and Carrie John. A bouquet of faded new beginnings in your hand, the spring in pieces, your steps, your breath lost on a path of shadows. Listen, way far away, apple tree, trees in blossom, the wind loaded with the purple tenderness of lilacs. Please advance a little further. Believe me, you will see the light changing. Le dernier poème, Les promesses chiffonnées. La lumière vient étirer le jour. Un autre hiver prendra fin. Même l'or se presse pour s'avancer sur nos montres. Tu entends le frémissement sous la neige, la joie rauque des corneilles, les bourgeons et leurs promesses chiffonnées. Le soleil s'écoule de la gouttière même si la marmotte a vu son ombre. Une prière se ferait un chemin au-delà de tes neiges amoncelées. Tu supplies les vers de tous les printemps. The Crumpled Promises, also translated by Luce Weyer and Kerry John. Light comes to lengthen the day. Another winter will end, even time is hurrying to advance our timepieces. You hear the quivering under the snow, the hoarse joy of crows, the buds of their crumpled promises. The sun flows out of the gutter, even if the groundhog has seen its shadow. A prayer makes its way beyond your piled up snow. You implore the green of every spring. Thank you. Uh, Sylvie Poisson for your promises, not crumpled at all, but flourishing in our hearts and minds. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Very nice, Sylvie. Um, Sarah? Yeah. I brought you a, a diva. Is that right? Yep. Um, okay, so the next poet that we're gonna invite is uh, Adiba Shahid Taluk Talukder. Is that how you say your last name? Yes. Yeah. Um, Talukdar, but yeah, close enough. Uh, say, say it again so that I'm not. Yeah, uh, Talukdar. Talukdar, thank you. Uh, Adiba is a Pakistani American poet, singer, and translator of Urdu and Persian poetry. She's the author of What Is Not Beautiful, published by Glass Poetry Press in 2018. And her debut collection, Shari Janan. Shahri Sorry. Go ahead, thank Yeah, Shahri Janan. Shari Janan. Uh, the City of the Beloved is, is coming, or looks like it came from Two Below Press 2020, is the winner of the uh, Kundiman Poetry Prize. Her poetry has also appeared in Palma Day, Gulf Coast, Two Below Quarterly, the margins and her translations have appeared in PBS Frontline and Words Without Borders. She's a Best of the Net finalist and a Pushcart nominee. She holds a MFA in creative writing from the University of Michigan and an Emerging Poets Fellowship from Poets House. Adiva, please grace us with your poetry. Thank you so much, Indran and Sarah. Um, uh, the first poem I'll be reading um, is titled A Song for My Nation. Uh, it's a poem I wrote a few months ago when um, the nation was especially in uh, turmoil and um, I didn't really know what I could do about it. Um, A Song for My Nation After Allen Ginsberg's America America, my love, your jewels perish, your seas blacken. America, we of water and clay melt in your chafing winters, your dusking streams. 
America, you've plundered the earth to build your shrine. Your devotees return to their homes each night, dust smeared, hands empty of bread. America, no one is dancing. America, your trucks fill with cold flesh, with sacred bodies. America, men shake and cry with death, shatter the mirrors of their own homes. America, Satan's guard your gates. They laugh and laugh. America, a man once told you, I can't breathe. America, in prayer to what God did you kneel upon his neck and stay? America, you've lit yourself on fire. America, you are red with fear. America, you're weary, cannot sleep. America, cleanse yourself, press your wound until there's no more blood, until your walls stop shuddering. America, the river of language has broken. America, you are holy, your cities filled with saints, lovers drunk with jasmine. America, love, we are of you. Turn to us, raise us to glory like your stained glass gods. Wonderful. And uh, my second poem is from my book, Shahri Jana, The City of the Beloved. And it's about a dance that I was training in uh, about seven years ago. Um, and I often think about with women and the burden of beauty. Um, the burden of pursuing it and the burden of being beautiful as well. Gathak, the dance of the courtesans. One, in the mirror, tilt your chin higher. At the end of each chakra, return to your own eyes. Your breath, a spool of thread, thin, sharp, unravels. Pull, pull it back in. Shackle yourself until your ankles are gold. Hold your wrists delicate beneath your jewels. Now dance, the city awaits you. Two, goddess, beloved, flame, they say. All beauty converges in you. Men gather at saints' tombs, but rush to your doorstep with greater madness. Let them gaze at you until you begin to tremble. Allow yourself to be slighted. You, fragile as glass, will learn. You were made to break. Three. In the final scene of the 1972 Hindi film, Pakiza, Meena Kumari's love is getting married to someone else and she's performing at his wedding. She shatters a lamp and dances upon its shards, leaving crimson footprints all over the white sheets. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Atipa. Very good. Beautiful. Ineffable beauty. Lovely. Um, I, 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 I don't know how to introduce the next poet, but I, I, I have to do the, my duty. His name is... Uh, a legend for me, De Cluri. Uh, a legend for many reasons, all mostly good ones. But no, he's. I've known Dick for a long time, and um, he um, has done a great. Uh, he does a great work for poetry. Aside from writing his poems and making his music, he uh, he edits poetry, uh, and, and he he has uh, been very lucky to have been worked with him on all three books I've published with Hanging Loose Press, including the latest one, The Migrant States. Um, so editor Ilmiglio Fabro, as uh, Elliot wrote to Ezra Pound, the better craftsman, Dick Lurie. Dick Lurie, uh, besides being the better craftsman, lives in Chelsea, Massachusetts. He has worked for over half a century on his poetry and his music. As a professional musician, he plays sax, trumpet, and guitar, ranging across genres, jazz, blues, pop, and folk. His poetry, widely recognized, has elicited praise from such 
great poets of America as Denise Levitov, who observed that his voice speaks with a unique and convincing eloquence. His music career includes a long stint with internationally renowned blues musician, Big Jack Johnson. He's a co-founder and still co-publisher of Hanging Loose Press, established in 1996. Go ahead, Dick. Ah, thank you. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, I think um, just one thing that just, oops, that just came in, which everybody might not have heard that uh, uh, Donald, this is from uh, former President Donald Trump's doctors who uh, announced that the, the, due to the, the severe trauma caused by the election, that he is now suffering uh, very seriously from electile dysfunction. <laughs> now that's, that's just in um, medical bulletin. Um, and also, uh, also with recent events, I've, I've started uh, exploring different forms of poetry in, um, again, inspired by recent events. So this is a little exploration, <coughs> very short. There once was a Biden named Joe, who was quite the political pro. When the time came to dump Mr. Donald J. Trump, it was Joe who delivered the blow. Now, uh, if I had realized that there was going to be an inauguration poet, I would have submitted it, but it, it was too late by that time. Um, all right, so much for that. Um, this is a poem, I think this is going to be in the, uh, yeah, it's going to be in there, that way. And this is a, a poem that I wrote, as you will see from the title, about 40 years ago, uh, in hopes that it would become irrelevant which it has not. It's called February 1981, The Systematic Murder of Black Children. This is not a political poem. Giving out your views, as they say, in that sense of democratic debate, kicking it around in discussion and argument, would be, in this case, a distraction. So I went with a title that's plain fact you could quickly verify, just discovered in Atlanta the body of the 17th, 17th black child murdered within the past year. Such a fact laid out so simply hard to forget might stick in your head a while, reminding you maybe whenever you see a black child, that they are miraculous. What do I mean? We need to behave, of course, with love and respect toward all children. But as for black children, you have to remember. You have to remember that someone is out to kill them. Why? Because they are black children. And so let them command your loyalty, your most clear and fierce attention. They are rare. They are in peril. Fewer of them will survive. Those who do are, yes, miracles. You must treat them like the bearers of your only hope for an end to the murders of black children. And... Uh, <coughs> This is another one, but both of these are from the, the book that's just coming out. And uh, most of the poems in the book have to do with music, as, as Indran said. I, that's a lot of what I do besides poetry. And just building on, I mean, they're sort of fused with jazz, blues, pop music. And it, 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 somewhere in the poem, it, 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 it links up with, with music. And this poem is called Object Permanence. When we go somewhere together, I like to be first out the door. I'll wait in the car. My wife closes up so I won't fret about checking the stove and all the locks. If one of us goes and the other stays, I like being the traveler. As in that old song, you'd be so nice to come home to. And so she is each time, nice by the 
fire under stars chilled by the winter all that i could desire august moon burning above so nice paradise while if it's me at home her out i'm thinking instead supermarket mass murder kidnapping car crash the wreck on the highway i went to the scene of destruction but i didn't hear nobody pray i guess this means i am stuck at that earlier stage in the life of infants. They will get upset when you leave the room because for them you have ceased to exist. They don't yet grasp that there is any, quote, world outside themselves. Later they develop object permanence. Object permanence, could there be a better name for a rock and roll band? Object permanence, they know that all existence does not depend on their presence. This is, of course, a comfort. They have realized that you will be back. Well, for me, at home, there's nothing except her absence. But with luck, we will get old together. And maybe by then, her face, her body so familiar, I won't lose sight of her in my mind, even when one of us walks out into the dark. Thank you. It's great to be here with, great to be here with everybody. It's really great. Thank you. Indra, and thanks. Very nice, thanks, Dave. Thank you. Okay. Sarah, go ahead. Thank you. I hear you read, Dick. I've heard a lot about you. Um, the next poet I'd like to introduce is Zilka Joseph. Her work has appeared in Poetry and Poetry Daily. She's been nominated for a Pushcart, Pan American Award, Award, and for Best of the Net. Her book, Sharp Blue, Search of Flame, published by Wayne State University Press, was a forward Indies Award finalist. She teaches creative writing workshops in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Her third chapbook, Sparrows and Dust, will be published later this month. And I will put her website in the chat, which reminds me if, uh, so far none of the bios I've read have had websites attached, but if you would like to share your website and you've read already, please share it. Okay, uh, Zilka, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Hi, Indra and Sarah. Hi. Thank you so much uh, for this beautiful, beautiful issue. I have enjoyed every single poem, and I so appreciate your creating this uh, international community, uh, especially um, in, in these times where we, I think we really need uh, each other, and poets particularly need to, to support each other. I'm just so honored to uh, be in the journal that has uh, Martin and Jane Hirschfield's work and Adiba, hi, you're gorgeous, really beautiful writing. Uh, I just want to let you know I'm, I'm an old Zell fellow from the MFA program. And I'm sorry that Naveen isn't here. I really want to meet him. Uh, I'm, I'm from Kolkata, I grew up there. So um, I was very thrilled to see Naveen in this uh, issue. And I hope uh, he probably doesn't remember me. I was this young kid running around, uh, you know, doing plays as well in college and stuff. And I was a teacher, um, high school teacher at St. James School. So anyway, um, I want to get back uh, to my poetry. And once again, thank, thanks so much for listening. Um, I'm going to read a short poem from my bookshop, Blue Search of Flame, which I hope you will uh, take a look at at Wayne State University Press. There's wonderful books, beautiful artwork. So please do check this out. Uh, I write a lot about birds and animals, but that's not the only thing I do write about. Uh, this poem is called The Blessed. Wings still glossy, she slouched in the shade of the marauding fig, wild roots swallowing cracked bricks. At the lip of our kitchen window, she waits, lopsided, tail ragged as if rat bitten, gaze deeper than hunger. My hand scrape down my plate, some meat I leave on the bones, extra grains of rice. She hops near, balancing this edge. Who will care for us, little sister? We who are broken, but not by our own hands. Tap tapping her beak, she picks cleanly. 
It's for bullies I keep watch. My eyes scour the sun-white rectangle of sky. Oh, small cousin of the rook and of the hard-beaked raven, how cruel are our kind. Do we not bleed? Do we not die? We are not ravaged by fury, but fear. So eat at my house, my one-eyed beauty. Rest here then, O oh bent-bodied bird, my wild, starved, one-legged one. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, the next poem I'm going to read is the poem that's in this beautiful Beltway Poetry Quarterly issue. And it's a poem called Mama Who'd Have Thought. And this poem is included in my new chapbook, uh, Sparrows and Dust, which will be published shortly by Ridgeway Press. And I hope to send you some information on that. And uh, it's a series of poems that talks about settling, settling, unsettling, settling in an arbor in, in America, coming from and uh, leaving home in India. Mama, who would have thought? Mama, who would have thought that after all these years in America, my love and I would finally have a place of our own? No, not a real house house, but a condo beside a pond. Not a real pukur like the lakes in Bengal that dad used to go fishing in but a man-made pond with a fountain where mallards and black ducks bring their broods of supercharged little ones and where the pied grebe pops up in spring and fall and the trumpeter swans I love so much visit too. Then the old regulars, a belted kingfisher and a couple of blue herons fish here. Sometimes in deep summer, cormorants unfurl and sun their long wings to dry while skimming the water. Dad would love this. Now you've come to see me, Ma. Let's go for a walk. Here, take my arm and let me guide you down slowly to the bank. The pavements are smooth. Not like those death traps in Kolkata. You're laughing. But careful. Here the ground is an uneven and slopes sharply to the pond. You're right. That clump of grass is where the geese I told you about nested last year. So sad. Oh, the neighbors are friendly. No, no one here is like us. Wait. Let me show you the giant goldfish, how the big ones wriggle as the heron tries to swallow them. If it rains tonight, we'll surely see some shoals churning on the surface. And so funny, once when the kingfisher caught a fish that was too heavy, or maybe it was thrashing too hard, she must have dropped it. For days we wondered who left this dead goldfish on our patio a sign from the spirit world that you live in now, we thought. And then you won't believe this. One afternoon we see an osprey. It hovered and plunged into the pond, emerged with a goldfish the size of a kitten in its talons. And it flashes right past the big picture window, not two feet from where my love and I watched mouths hanging open. Yes, we took a photo, but it was so sudden. It's all blurry. I'll show you when we go back in. It happened so fast. That gorgeous bird stayed for two weeks. I think it will return this fall. The red-tailed hawks and Cooper's hawks are always hunting around here. What? Are we safe? Yes, yes, and no. No, ma. America is not safe. Sure, some policemen kill people who don't look like them. It's scary. White men march nowadays, shouting threats. 
They put children in cages at the border. Have they no hearts? Bad things could happen to us here too. This is our home now, Ma. You didn't want us to leave. You wept for days. Forgive us. We could not bring you here then. Now your spirit is here. Protect us. Please stay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank Thanks, you so Sarah. much. Thanks, Sarah. Sarah. Thanks for listening. We um, uh, we have some time. I would like to read now Martin's poem. He asked if he could, if I could uh, share it with you. It's uh, the one that appears in the in the issue, um, and then um, it's um, it's called. Um, not for him the fiery lake of the false prophet. And it has an epigraph from Donald Trump from 2015 that says, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. They woke him up by pissing in his face. He opened his mouth to scream in Spanish, so his mouth became a urinal at the ballpark. Scott and Steve, the leader brothers, celebrating a night at Fenway where the Sox beat the Indians and a rookie named Rodriguez spun the seams on his change up to hypnotize the tribe. Later that night, Steve urinated on the door of his cell and Scott told the cops why they did it. Donald Trump was right. All these illegals used to be deported. He was a Mexican in a sleeping bag outside JFK station on a night in August. So they called him a wetback and emptied their bladders in his hair. In court, the lawyer spoke his name, Guillermo Rodriguez, immigrant with papers, crop picker in the fields, trader of bottles and cans collected his cart. Two strangers squashed the cartilage in his nose like a can drained of beer. In dreams, he would remember the shoes digging into his ribcage, the pole raked repeatedly across his cheekbones and upraised knuckles, the high five over his body. Donald Trump was right, said Scott, and Trump said the people that are following me are very passionate. His hands fluttered as he spoke, a demagogue's hands, no blood under the fingernails, no whiff of urine to scrub away. He would orchestrate the chant of build the wall rally after rally, bellowing till the blood rushed to his face, red as a demagogue in the grip of masturbatory dreams. A tribute to the new conquistador, the wall raised up by Mexican hands, Mexican hair and fingernails bristling in the brick, Mexican blood swirling in the cement like raspberry syrup on a vanilla sundae. On the Cinco de Mayo, he leered over a taco bowl at Trump Tower, not for him the fiery lake of the false prophet reddening his ruddy face. Not for him the devils of Puritan imagination, shrieking in a foreign tongue and climbing in the window like the immigrant demons he conjures for the crowd. Not even for him 10,000 years of the leader brothers st streaming a fountain of, of piss in his face as he sputters forever. For him, hell is a country where the man in a hard hat paving the road to JFK station sees Guillermo and dials 911. Hell is a country where EMTs kneel to wrap a blanket around the shivering shoulders of Guillermo and wipe his face clean. Hell is a country where the nurse at the emergency room hangs a morphine drip for Guillermo so he can go back to sleep. 2,000 miles away, someone leaves a trail of water bottles in the desert for the border crossing of the next Guillermo. We smuggle ourselves across the border of a demagogue's dreams. Confederate generals on horseback tumble one by one into the fiery lake of false prophets. Into the fiery lake crumbles the demolished wall. Thousands stand, sledgehammers in hand, to await the bullhorns and handcuffs, await the trembling revolvers. In the full moon of the flashlight, every face interrogates 
the interrogator. In the full moon of the flashlight, every face is the face of Guillermo. That's a poem by Martin Espada. Martin, by the way, is just publishing a new book, which he's presenting on Monday. Uh, Sarah? I'd like to read one of Kim's poems now, you think if that's all right? That's great. Yeah, one from the anthology, one of the poems. In the anthology. Yeah. yeah, Kim Roberts, uh, the former editor of Beltway Poetry Quarterly. Um, it's foundress, could not be here with us, but she sent us some poetry from this uh, book she is editing called, Broad, I think you introduced it already, but it's called By Broad Potomac Shore, Great Poems from the Early Capital. And I want to read this, this piece called Cloture, which is on the website that you may read because I think it's hilarious. It's, uh, it's kind of sexy, but it's also got government terms in it. The poet's George Alfred Townsend. Um, he was a journalist and he's, the bio she sent us says he was known for covering the, uh, best known as for covering the Civil War and the assassination of President Lincoln. So um, interesting guy can read about him. Cloture. The Senate sloths sit up tonight. Dear Kitty, come with me. The crowded Capitol was bright. Dark was our gallery. They crowded me and Kitty so, her courage to assure. My arm around her waist I throw. The subject is cloture. How mad they get, said Kitty soon. Our matters so demure. They rush upon each other close. Is that not like cloture? No, this more like that thing occult she cuddled so demure. I hope we'll come to some results and early pass cloture. Not did we hear that blessed night yet sat in perfect bliss when noise and wrath were at their height cloture concealed a kiss. Are you in favor of repeal? I think tis quite obscure. Light up the subject with your lips, dear kitty press cloture. Why do we need so much reserve? I'm sure we are secure. I think more faith would give them nerve and therefore more cloture. Kitty, our circulation's high, this panic may endure, and legal tenders in my eye, if you but say cloture. At panic prices, we drove back that herdic tilted sure. Kitty came sliding down the hack and all went on cloture. I've changed my mind, tis nice to wait, engagements can endure but never let them close debate while we can have cloture that's the poem <laughs> thank you you know um we uh have a we have some time but i'd like uh, just to take a few minutes and we'll just chat about uh the you know the issue is called the dream returned and uh there are a number of poets in the room and friends of poetry and and from Australia, I think we have people, uh, Dominique, who's going to be reading next week, is, um, I think, uh, beaming in from Australia, from Melbourne, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, welcome, Dominique. Uh, Dominique, you will hear her on the 30th. And uh, Louisa Schneidman is going to be reading next week as well. And she's, I think, coming in from Boston, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Philadelphia. From Philadelphia, sorry. And um, and then we have um, any other poets uh, scheduled. Jonathan Harrington is, uh, we published in previous issues. He's he's in Merida, Mexico at the moment. He's with us. Uh, um, so please, uh, let's have a, just a few minutes for the chat to go ahead. Uh, if there are any questions uh, about where uh, Beltway is going, where the country is going, what, whatever you'd like to discuss, uh, where the world is moving. Will poetry and the world uh, become one in this unity government? Of, uh, uh, the floor is open. We'll take a few minutes. Uh, feel free to come in and out, and then we'll we could close the session if you like. I could read a poem by Jane Hirschfeld from the collect from the issue as well, uh, or from Andre Kudrescu. There are many things, riches in the in the magazine to discover. People who couldn't be with us today, but. Uh, I wanted to just mention them to you. Go ahead. Questions, comments, anyone? In interim, do you have a theme for the next issue yet? Uh, we're sort of assessing uh, the unity question. Whether it, 
<laughs> no, no, we haven't got a theme yet, but I, that's on my mind. <laughs> how, uh, how, how we can uh, contribute to that? Uh, but uh, that's my thought. Uh, we haven't, we haven't decided yet. Sarah, would you um, help me out here? We haven't decided yet. I think the, but the practice for the last few issues has been kind of looking at, at the group of poems that we've had and assessing based on what the poems say. Um, and then what the world, well, the theme evolves from the issue, I think. Would you disagree? Yeah, no, and, and you know, we, you know we, did, we did two issues, Art in the Times of Crisis in 2020. And then, and then the stream return sort of naturally took, came up and then the election took place and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris won and, and, and it just opened up a whole, the notion of the dream, the American dream and the dream that uh, Langston Hughes wrote about that was deferred in Langton's poem being uh, sort of available to us again. And here we just heard um, Amanda read that poem at the inauguration, a new generation of, of poets. And uh, uh, so, you know, we are, I think we are um, seeing all these very positive uh, signs despite the long-standing, um, uh, you know, intractable, I mean, uh, problems of, of, of American life, you know, this um, two steps forward, one step back. I remember Sonia Sanchez saying that about how the society advances two steps forward, then it goes one step back. We took a, a giant step back in the recent four years. <laughs> so now we, are, we need to <laughs> try to compensate and take a giant uh, step forward. Um, the um, so four I, go ahead. Four giant steps forward. Four giant steps forward. Right. Um, other comments and questions, thoughts. Uh, so the next issue. Look, uh, feel free to send poems uh, via email to Beltway Poetry Submissions at gmail dot com. We're not doing a call for submissions, but you you heard it. Beltway Poetry Submissions at gmail dot com. We are, um, look forward to reading your work. Of any variety poem. I think maybe that's yeah. too much. We haven't done a themed call in, you know, about a year since the Art and Times of Crisis issues. So of any poems of any variety. And go ahead, questions, comments, thoughts. I also just, may I just do a plug for the Poetry Channel, which is something I do on YouTube, where I'm, compiling and presenting poets and from around the world in different languages, no language limits. So if you feel like sending a video of you reciting one of your poems or a poem by someone else, uh, please do and send it by email to me and uh, with a little biography and, uh, and the title of the poem and I will go ahead and, and, and include it on the channel. So keep, keep that in mind, the poetry channel on YouTube. Thank you to everyone who read today. Thank you. It's really a labor of love, isn't it? Because we, so um, thank you. And thank you, Dominique, for waking up so early or staying up so late in Australia. I don't know what time it is there now, but I'm very grateful for the interest. And, and uh, Sudip Tamenta from India, I don't know if she's still with us, but she uh, heard the earlier part of the show. Okay, um, I don't want to uh, end, but a beautiful afternoon in non sequitur, so I'll try to be quiet. Jorge, do you have any comments? Quieres decir algo desde México? Micrófono, ya. Pues un abrazo a todos, a todas. Felicidades por su nuevo gobierno, porque la poesía tiene un lugar simbólico importante en en Estados Unidos ahora y ya. So Jorge said, uh, congratulations for your a new government and that poetry now has a symbolic place in America. And he's grateful for that and appreciative of that. Muchas gracias, Jorge. Um, and then um, let's, uh, let's, uh, I think, I think the, the quiet is uh, suggesting of um, that we're still absorbing all of this Good work, and I'll. Um, I think we'll have to 
close for the moment, but let me recite to you uh, the poem, one of the poems that Jane um, Hirschfield sent us for this issue. It's from her new book called Ledger. And uh, unless someone else would like to say something, or Sarah, would you like to add any last parting words? No, I, I think uh, I think that the silence is really maybe exhalations or inhalations of enough poetry to end the afternoon on. So take us out. Okay, this one uh, it's the first poem in the book. It's called "Let Them Not Say." The poem. Let them not say we did not see it, we saw. Let them not say we did not hear it, we heard. Let them not say they did not taste it, we ate, we trembled. Let them not say it was not spoken, not written, we spoke, we witnessed with voices and hands. Let them not say they did nothing, we did not enough. Let them say, as they must say something, a kerosene beauty, it burned. Let them say, we warmed ourselves by it, read by its light, praised, and it burned. Muchisimas gracias. Many thanks. Merci beaucoup. Shalom. Peace. Thank and, you, uh, everyone. Sarah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. You all have a great afternoon. Thank you. See you next week, next Saturday, if you're able to come. Same time. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Hasta más, hasta más tarde. Yeah, yeah. Hasta siempre. Bye-bye.